We have uh, Professor Komu Oliver from the Univer uh, Federal University of uh, Santa Catarina, in the south of Brazil, in the beautiful city of Florianópolis, uh, which is uh, partly in a beautiful island, the island of uh, Santa Catarina, um, where it is always good weather. Not as grey as here, <laughs> a little bit more colourful. And um, about uh, the speaker, I can tell you that it's a great pleasure to have uh, uh, Pablo here with us today, essentially because he's one of the charismatic personalities of real-time systems in Brazil. I would say one of the beginners. I, I know that there were probably a few that uh, you know, started doing work in this area before, but Romo has been working on this consistently for uh, many years and uh, has delivered many PhD students as well and always with high quality work. And, uh, and uh, today we have uh, uh, a talk about um, probabilistic execution time using extreme uh, value theory. And uh, also the, the first time that I heard about this was uh, because of the work of George Lima, which comes from a little bit uh, south of uh, Florianopolis, so from uh, Bahia, a distance more or less from here to uh, Moscow, or you know, <laughs> very close. And um, but it was exactly a work on the on this topic, and I, and I and it caught my attention because I think it, it was very nice and it uh, delivered the interesting results and promising results. Although, as always, these uh, probabilistic approaches raise some concerns, and uh, and so we have now a follow up, and so. Uh, uh, another work on this topic and uh, we will be updated uh, now by my home. So thank you very much for coming and for sharing this work with us. So we look forward to here. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Luis, for, for having me here and for your sister for having me here too. Uh, I apologize, my English is uh, not so good. I will try to make it uh, easier for you. Before starting the, the real presentation, I brought some slides to show you where I come from. Okay, uh, I'm a professor at the uh, Department of Automation and Systems at the Federal University of Santa Catarina, as, as we uh, said. So this is, is Brazil in South America, right? Uh, the state of Santa Catarina is the second southeast state of Brazil, we have a, a large coast and also we have, a, we share a, 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 some border with Argentina at the far west. And uh, uh, Florianópolis is that, that island uh, at the, the, the coast, it's, uh, it's a big island, it's about 50 kilometers from north to south and about 10 kilometers from east to west. And, uh, Across the state is about uh, 600 kilometers. I, I know that because I, I go twice a year to Argentina to buy wine with that. Because Argentinian wine is much better than ours and uh, the, the exchange rate is, is, uh, makes them very, very cheap. So it's uh, a long trip to, to buy wine. Um, uh, being an island, okay, we have lots of Beach. It's a very tourist city. Uh, Florianopolis in, in January is something like Faro in August. It is, it's this kind of, of place, okay? And, but also in Santa Catarina we have our Serra, the, the mountains. Uh, actually the coldest cities in Brazil are in Santa Catarina and, and not in Rio Grande do Sul, the southeast state, because of the mountains. And Urupema is the coldest city in Brazil. Uh, last August, the minimum temperature was minus, uh, minus 8 uh, Celsius. Uh, that was the, the minimum temperature of that winter. So it's, it's quite cold there, too. Okay. Uh, and uh, the University of uh, the Federal University of Santa Catarina is a public university founded by the federal government around 1960. We have uh, about 40,000 uh, undergrad students and 10,000 uh, uh, graduate students. It's about uh, 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 3,000 3, uh, faculty members and we have uh, about 50 PhD programs. It, it's one of the 10 largest uh, universities in Brazil. So, 
Uh, I'm going to, to move now to the presentation. Okay. Uh, we have our measurements, 
we split, we divide the measurements in blocks, and then we use only the maximum of each block. So that would be the, the red dots here. From the red dots, I try to fit uh, a model distribution curve that will allow me to make predictions regarding very extreme, very rare events. Um, the, the, the other techniques, the peaks over threshold, where I uh, arbitrate the threshold and I look only at values above the threshold. And then the same again, I try to, to fit a model uh, uh, pro, uh, distribution curve to the data that, that I have. Well, uh, this is, is, is uh, from statistics uh, work, right? Uh, when we, we use that, there is a, a, a enormous amount of, of theory and papers behind this stuff that the, from the statistics field. Uh, when we use uh, block mass, we have to use our data to uh, generalize event value family of distribution. And when we use peaks over threshold, we adjust, we fit a curve from the generalized Pareto family to our data. And uh, both techniques are somewhat equivalent. Uh, they are both used. Uh, block maxima is uh, interesting when we, we, you are doing, uh, dealing with uh, temperature, the maximum temperature of an year. So, uh, the year comes nicely as a, your block. So you just split your temperatures in years and use the maximum of each year. Then your prediction is in terms of blocks, of, of years. So it's very handy. Uh, the, the, the arbitration of a threshold is somewhat tricky. So that, that's another difficult. But our experience, and if you look at the literature, you will see that both are used and there is not uh, a, 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 a big advantage of one over, other, over the other. So, but in order to do this, uh, I have to provide some, uh, some uh, um, assumptions. I have to test some assumptions before doing the fitting of the, the distribution curves on my, my data. Uh, so, uh, basically, uh, the data has to be independent and uh, identically distributed. There are some papers where uh, it shows that the, the distribution is stationary, you, you don't have to have independent measures, but uh, there, there is anyway a, a, a certain uh, amount of uh, assumption that you have to show evidence. And uh, you do this by using classic uh, statistical tests. There is a dozen of statistical tests for, for this kind of thing, and, and uh, people use uh, several of them. Uh, one, one important observation here is that uh, unlikely the people that uh, deal with temperatures and <coughs> wave size and such we have the luxury of uh, generating a large, large amount of data. I mean, if you, if, you, if you are concerned with the maximum temperature of each year, you can't, get, you can't go back 100 years to measure temper temperatures back there to include in your data. You are quite limited here. But, but uh, we can do, in computer science, and I, I, I have a, a task, a real-time task that runs on a certain processor, and it takes one millisecond or such. Well, I, I, can, I can measure it millions and millions and millions of times. So uh, this is something that we are going to, to use here uh, in, 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 in a couple of slides, but also, also to test this uh, hypothesis. Because Typically, this, this hypothesis uh, test uh, is done by computing what's called a p-value and comparing the p-value to a, a certain value for like the, the, the classic the 0.05 or something. Uh, but if you can generate lots and lots of data, I can compute uh, hundreds and thousands of p-values from 
different samples. And then I will not look at one p-value against uh, a threshold, but I, I will look at their distribution between 0 and 1. So if, uh, typically I, have, uh, I can test the assumptions uh, uh, in a much more robust way than usually the, the, the users of uh, extreme value theory uh, do. But even after uh, you, you uh, showed evidence from the assumptions, so uh, EU requirements, okay, you have to, to check your final fitting. So it usually uses the um, uh, uh, quantile points. Okay? Here we have uh, the, the dark, the, the bold dots, uh, it's our measured data, and they are plotted uh, against what is expected from from the model distribution I, I created. And, and at the, the right, this is a, a, a very good fitting because the, the measured data is uh, almost perfectly uh, on the, the expected data from my model distribution. Here, uh, at the left, it, it's not so good. I can see that uh, there, 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 are, there is a distortion uh, at the, the low values and at the, the high values. But then, we're talking about worst case execution time, so uh, it's safe if I stay above the real worst case execution time. This plot shows me that my, uh, at the high values, my measurements are actually below the projected model distribution. So it, it's, not, it's not very, uh, it's not exact, right? It's, it's not a good fitting from a general perspective, but it's safe. So uh, it probably would be accepted. This is the part of uh, the, the whole thing that makes me more nervous because you have to, to look at, uh, because the, the, the classic, the typical, test to accept the fitting of your curve with your measurements is looking at this figure. So uh, we're talking about real-time tests usually in like planes, right? So you have to look at this figure and say, well, yeah, I think I will find that plane because the curve is more or less okay. So it's a very subjective uh, decision. Well, uh, so, the, the application of uh, uh, extreme value theory in measurement-based probabilistic time analysis has uh, several steps, right? We have to collect a representative uh, or pessimistic sample of the execution times. Uh, we have to show that they are uh, uh, independent, uh, identically distributed, and uh, some other prehexits to, to, to be analyzable through EVT. Then you have to choose between block maxima or POT in order to select the values from the measurement we will use to fit a model curve to them. Then we make the, the, uh, the fitting of the the extreme value distribution using also techniques from classical statistics. And uh, finally, we have to show evidence that the fitting was uh, well done, which is usually through uh, uh, quantile plots. And after that, if you, if you are satisfied with the, the fitting you have, then you can use the adjusted model to predict uh, probabilistic to, to obtain probabilistic worst case execution time figures. Yeah. At the end, you have uh, uh, this model distribution, and then you can say, well, I will use uh, prob probabilistic uh, worst case execution time of such value. I can compute the uh, uh, exceedance probability of this value uh, that the area uh, uh, below the curve. Or you can say, no, I, I want an exceedance probability of 10 to minus 10. So, uh, well, I, so I'm going to use this value of uh, probabilistic worst case execution time. Okay? So you, we, uh, 
replace the, the, the classic worst case execution time estimate that's an upper bound to the real one, that's usually unknown, by this probabilistic view of the worst case execution time. As long as you can live with this exceedance probability, everything is fine. Or you can have a, 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 a a uh, mechanism behind that, so in, if you one day you uh, experience in hand time uh, uh, the execution time above the, your probabilistic worst case execution time, you have some mechanism to deal with this time fault. Well, uh, so what was our motivation in this study? We, we tried to create some form to build confidence in the results. Our idea is that was actually very simple. Since I can uh, generate tons and tons of measurements, okay, well, I, I will not be able to, to generate 10 to the power of 50 measurements, okay. But I, I, I can, in order to 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 obtain a, a model distribution, you need a few hundreds, a few thousands. Of, of measurements, uh, that, that's, that's enough. But if I have a, a real-time test on a processor, it takes about some milliseconds to run. I can run, 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 and obtain several million measurements. Uh, 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 and if, if my prediction of uh, an exceedance probability of 10 to minus 10 or 10 to minus 12 uh, is correct, well, uh, that value should not be observed, even if I, I grow my uh, my sample to many, many, many millions. And that was uh, what uh, we did. Uh, so we empirically assessed the reliability of the probabilistic worst case execution times uh, by collecting a large uh, sample of the execution time. We were able to collect 10 to the power of 8 samples. So it's, it's uh, still, of course, uh, small if you compare to exceeding probabilities of 10 to minus 12 or, or something. But, well, if, if you do that uh, exceeds probability of 10 to minus 12 is correct, I do not expect to observe any value above my probabilistic worst case execution time uh, with a sample of this size. Something that uh, people with uh, uh, size of waves or level of rivers cannot do. Okay. Uh, so it's important to have in mind that we have the modeling samples, a few thousand measurements used to uh, uh, obtain uh, the model distribution, and we have the validation samples, that is uh, 100 million uh, measurements that uh, we will use to check the my probabilistic worst case execution time. And uh, we, uh, at, uh, considering the validation samples, we look at the high water marks, the, the highest value observed. Uh, I will show you some results. We did uh, many, many replications, very uh, statistical, statistical tests for this and for that, and, and a lot of things, and the results were quite uh, uh, the same, equivalent. It was very uh, robust, the, the result. Uh, and and I, I present to you the result in, in uh, the form of this kind of figure. Okay? So what do we have here? Uh, at the X, I have sample size for the feeding process, okay? So you can see that with sample size, uh, uh, with a small sample size, you have a, a, a lot of noise at the, the distribution model you, you obtain. But as the sample size for the feeding process uh, grows to like 4,000, 5,000 measurements, it kind of stabilizes. So, uh, from now on, it's, it makes no point in, in, in uh, uh, using more, sample, uh, more measurements to make the fitting of the model work. 
Here I have the result. I have the probabilistic worst case execution time uh, for an exceedance probability of 10 to minus 50. So what I'm saying is that uh, uh, 25,800 25, uh, is a value such that the probability of having a measurement above this value is 10 to minus 50. Uh, <coughs> the, 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 the techniques, the statistical techniques that we use to create the model distribution uh, give you a confidence interval. The distributions we have at the end are defined by three parameters, and um, the three parameters are not uh, exact numbers, but uh, they are statistical uh, obtained, so you have to deal with uh, a certain uh, confidence interval. So this, this dark area here represents the 95% confidence interval for the probabilistic worst case execution time. So I have this value, 25,800, but actually, well, it could be a little bit above, a little bit below. I have this confidence interval. And that is the 95% confidence interval. Uh, and finally, we have this line here. This line here is the high water mark for our validation samples. So, oh, that means, uh, uh, by making uh, 100 million measurements, the highest value I observed uh, was uh, 25,300 uh, uh, times. So, this is a, a good result. This is good because, well, uh, I, don't, I do not expect to observe values close to my probabilistic worst case execution time if the probability, the exceedance probability is 10 to minus 50, and I'm looking at only uh, 10 to the power of 8 observations. So this is good, things are good here. Uh, so we start from here and try to uh, set this. We use the real hardware samples and we use synthetic data. Uh, the new hardware samples were obtained for a, a randomized processor. The processor had uh, uh, randomized the cache, randomized the bus. The latency of arithmetic operations were maximized. We, we built this processor. We put it on a field, uh, FPGA, uh, field, programmable. Huh? field programmable uh, gateway. Okay, I'm not a hardware guy. Now know that. <laughs> and so we run that on a, on a FPGA and, and collected the data. Uh, but the, the most important part is this one. We, we uh, supposed, we, we assumed we had a real-time task and an imaginary processor such that running that imaginary real-time task on that imaginary processor, the measurements would be exactly from a, a, a model distribution that we predefined the parameters. So it's the, 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 the best possible scenario that you will have to apply uh, extreme value theory, you know? Because everybody, you, you have to ask yourself, this, this task, this processor, is it okay to apply this thing? Uh, but now I know, no, yes, it's the the best scenario ever. So we generate the data from a model distribution it tries it, and we try to fit it back in, a, in another uh, uh, not constructed uh, model distribution. So we, uh, we tried with GEV from Block Maxima. Uh, uh, location and scale uh, were fixed, but the, the really important parameter is the shape. So the shape can be negative, zero, or positive, depending on that they have different names, right? And, and uh, 
a GEV with shape zero is called a gumbo uh, distribution. And when you use a pix over threshold, you end up with a generalized Pareto distribution. We fix the threshold in the scale, and then we vary the shape. Uh, in, in when we have a, a, a generalized Pareto distribution with shape, of, uh, shape equal to zero, uh, we have an exponential distribution. Uh, and, and this is important because there is a huge debate over what you should do. You should uh, identify the shape of your data and use a model distribution with that shape, or you should always force a shape zero. And I, I don't care about the shape of my data. I'm going to use a model distribution with shape equal to zero. This is a, a, a not going there are dozens of papers uh, in the li real time literature uh, arguing against one, uh, against the other, for one, for another. And uh, when we start here, we were pretty sure that was, uh, would be better to use uh, the shape measured from our data in our model distribution, because that makes sense. I mean, the, the, the shape it gives you, the shape is the shape of the right tail, right? It's extremely important, because if you change the shape of your right tail, there at the 10 to minus 15, that makes a huge difference. Uh, and then we were surprised because the results were very consistent and, and uh, totally against what we were expecting. Uh, for the real time, uh, the Hill Harbor samples, uh, what we have here is uh, four, four figures. Uh, here, I ha I, here I used block maximum. And here I, uh, uh, I use the uh, peaks over threshold. At this figure, uh, using block maxima, we tried to fit uh, the, the data to a uh, model distribution with very shape. Uh, shape. Uh, we, we used in our model distribution the same shape we observed in the original data. And you can see here, result is uh, uh, terrible because they, uh, they say that with a probability, exceedance probability of 10 to minus 50, uh, I have values that are actually observed in 10 to the power of 8 uh, sample. So it, it's completely unsafe and reliable. But if I, uh, uh, no, no matter the, what I measure, I, I force a shape zero in my model distribution, then it's safe. Because now, yes, uh, uh, I have this value with an exceedance probability of 10 to minus 50. I, I, I'm not looking, I'm not finding it in a sample of 10 to the power of 8. And if you go to POT, uh, again, if you try to, to, to fit a generalized Pareto uh, distribution to our data with its very shape, again, unreliable, unsafe. But if yeah, I force a, a shape equal to zero, an exponential uh, distribution, it's it's same. It's a, a lot noisy, and not so beautiful as here, but it's still it's safe. Well, this is for a bubble sort task on our uh, randomized processor, right? We we try to uh, be binary search, counting numbers in a matrix, or uh, and. CRC and, and a lot of tests. The results are always the same. If you try to, by using block maxima, if you try to, to use a generalized event value uh, distribution, you end up with uh, unsafe results. But if you force a gumbo uh, modeling, uh, it's safe. And uh, when we use the, uh, try to speed up. Uh, when uh, you use uh, synthetic samples, you have the, the, the control over the shape of the data. So, uh, so I, I can uh, generate uh, in our, our imaginary 
real-time test on our imaginary processor can generate measurements with different shapes that I, I contour with. So I, I have three negative shapes, zero and three positive shapes. And then we tried to, to fit those data to, uh, again, uh, uh, two options, uh, uh, bucket maxima and uh, points over threshold. And again, if I try to, to use in my model distribution the shape, the original shape I uh, detect in my uh, model sampling, uh, I have unsafe results. And, and Google gives me uh, a safe result. And, and it goes on and on. Here, the, the original shape was minus one half. And, uh, and, uh, uh, Oh yes, the, 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 the original data here was from a GV uh, curve and here from a GP curve. And, and here I, I try to fit it to pot, uh, GP pot exponential, and here we have two options. Well, uh, it doesn't matter that the, the results are, are the same. And uh, here the original data is from uh, a uh, uh, distribution with shape zero, and then we are forcing to to fit it to shape zero. It goes okay, but if you try to detect the original shape and, and use it in our model distribution, results are unsafe. Uh, if you, we have at the original data a, a positive shape, then it's unsafe uh, always. You just cannot use the, the technique as it's here because the, 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 your probabilistic worst case execution time will be uh, or extremely pessimist or completely unreliable. Uh, so at the end we tried to uh, put together some uh, recommendations, right? Because the, as I said, we were not expecting those results. So our, our experience from this uh, uh, work is that if, if you are first thing, if you want to apply EVT on, uh, on uh, execution times, the first thing you do, have to do is to uh, try to figure out what is the shape of the original data. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's the same technique you use to create a model distribution. You try to approximate the shape of your original data. And if, if it is, is positive, uh, it's not uh, possible to apply the technique. It's just it uh, will be extremely pessimistic or uh, unreliable to, to use it. Uh, if your original date, uh, data is uh, it has a negative shape, you can use the technique, but you have to force the model distribution to have a, a shape equal to zero, regardless of the original shape of your name. Uh, that actually uh, introduces pessimism in your uh, probabilistic worst case execution time, but at least it will be said to be reliable. And uh, if the original data has a shape of zero, uh, you, you can apply the technique and, and, and again, uh, you model, your model distribution will be a Goomba or exponential, shape zero. That's okay because, well, the original data was from shape zero. The, the, the fact here is that the shape is extremely important, but to from, from a small sample, to, to figure out exactly what was the what what is the shape of your data is this uh, uh, unreliable because you have those confidence intervals that that confidence interval gives you a, 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 a best guess to the original shape and and if you change the shape a little bit your projections will go up and down a, a lot so uh, to force the model uh, to have a shape equal to zero is just uh, uh, a pessimistic action, but it makes your results more safe. Okay? If, you, if the original data was uh, has a, a positive shape, then uh, 
I, I don't see how you can do that. Uh, all right, double clock, and uh, that's what I had. Thank you very much. <laughs> so a timely presentation, just uh, on the clock, despite uh, the delay that was essentially my fault in the beginning. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, any question, uh, comment that uh, you would like to do? I, I can start because uh, this, you know, raises a lot of things and uh, uh, interesting questions actually. So one of them is, um, of course, there is this issue with the shapes in finding an adequate shape. But the, as you say, essentially it comes down to these shapes only that are the, the ones that are the best. So other shapes are not reliable. And, and then you say, this uh, um, give us this, um, this situation in which the probabilistic bound is sufficiently separated from what was observed. So can we bring it closer? And uh, how can we do, can we lower the, for example, instead of 10 to the minus uh, 15, 10 to the minus 12, will it come down? How safe can we do? What is this thing of the confidence intervals? Uh, can we go to 99.99% confidence intervals? Uh, is this reasonable? It's like two times probability. It's the probabilistic bound and then the actual yeah. confidence interval. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Actually, there are two or three things uh, you mentioned that it can, can be done. Uh, of course, let me see. Okay. Uh, uh, of course, if you uh, uh, 10 to minus 15, it, it's extremely low. I, 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 people, I guess, use more like uh, minus 9 or minus 12 or something. So, of course, if you uh, have uh, uh, the, the exceedance probability at the small values, this, the, the, the pessimism will be reduced. But you, you mentioned something that is very interesting too, because you see, I, I, I had uh, here, uh, for, uh, I, I had data from uh, original curves with very different shapes, and I forced everybody to zero. If I, 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 I reduce this, this, this step, and, and, and perhaps I could use a, a negative shape in my modeling, but not as negative as the original, but just enough to have a, 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 mar a safety margin in, in the system? I, I, that's a good question. I, I never saw anybody try this, but it, it could work. Very interesting. And, um, so that's the next paper. Yeah, well, I hope so. <laughs> and and, and uh, well, that, that was it, right? Yeah. Uh, about the confidence interval. So, ah, okay. Uh, uh, you see, uh, uh, those those it, this, those methods are, are from classic statistics. So actually, we we uh, I, I, my background in statistics is very very basic. So uh, we didn't want to to touch that part. So we used uh, what, what, what everybody used, and I I, I have uh, I, I'm not sure about how to answer, it. but perhaps but perhaps we could. Uh, uh, rework the fitting process, the, the way we uh, compute the three parameters for our model distribution uh, in order to, to have something better for us. Because the, the extreme value theory has the, 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 the goal of giving you a fair estimate of the low probability. But in real-time systems, we are okay with pessimism. Okay, another bound works for us. So perhaps we could revisit the fitting process in order to to add some pessimism, but to, to stay safe. Yeah. That, I, I, that, that's something that I, I think it's it's possible to work in that uh, margin. That yes, is. yes. I. Do we touch the? The part of the of the statistic analysis, but I'd like to touch the, the issue of the data because usually when you've got garbage in data, you get garbage out, right? So I was wondering, one of the main 
assumptions is that your data is independent, your samples are independent. But sometimes the, the system doesn't work like that. You've got models, you've got internal state. Yeah. And once you start having maybe a worst case execution time which is very large, maybe the next iteration will also be very large. Yes. So uh, how do you handle that? Yeah, in, in, in this work you, we did not, did not uh, look at this problem. Uh, this is a very, very serious big problem to the application of the, the techniques. There are works when you try to uh, get rid uh, of the independence uh, uh, assumption by uh, uh, proving that the distribution is, is always stationary, it's the same. But that's not also true because uh, you, you mentioned modes of operation, right? And, and uh, Yes, that, that is that is touchy. That's a problem. Uh, the in the, uh, there is one point though. Uh, the independent the, the, the independence uh, among the maximas of the block, the maxima uh, of the of the blocks, uh, may be enough. So you you, you don't have to have uh, independence between two uh, consecutive executions, as long as you have independence from the block masses. But uh, still, I, I, I agree with you. There, there are several other problems, like um, every measurement comes from a, a, a test case in the day, right? So how are you sure that you observe the all paths within your product? That, that's a problem, too. Um, we, we, th these slides uh, were uh, very similar to a, a presentation we gave to Embraer engineers in last May. We had a, a, an internal workshop in Embraer. Jerry Lima participated too, and uh, they gave they gave us data from real systems of them. And 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 one of the the, the tasks that they measured the, the the observation the the frequency of the measured values. Uh, was like this, uh, a mountain, and then a, a smaller mountain, and then a smaller mountain, and, and that is it. Of course, there are three modes of operation, and, and actually they, they confirm that uh, they have uh, uh, several uh, global variables, uh, permanent global variables, that the value is changing along the time, and as you go executing, the, those values impact the execution time. So the, the question is, all right, I, I can make the fit in here, but uh, uh, what if there is a, a fourth uh, mountain, one mountain here that I'm not looking at? I, I cannot uh, fit a model distribution to data that I'm not uh, seeing. Okay. So, but but, yes. in, but in that particular case, you were going to fit the, the tips of those little mountains, not exactly the valleys, right? So, uh, no, which, no, which in some way could be safer. Uh, I, I, that's that's uh, my feeling too, but that, that's not going so. to happen because if, you, uh, uh, if your threshold cuts, now you, you have something like this, right? Yeah. If you put the threshold here, you see only the slope of the very last mountain, yeah. and, 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 and you lose the... But if you, but if you fit the peaks, then uh, no. it's different. If you just fit, it's like, uh, it's basically what this does, because you are only looking at the peaks, right? So it's like uh, taking only the, the highest values, and so we, that, is, that is more robust to these, uh, well, to these okay. values that you have. I think it's uh, one of the reasons why they use these uh, the, the, the yeah, this filtering of just uh, peaks. Yeah, I, I, I think that for the, the, the application of the extreme value theory, we have to look at the control graph of the task, the, the software. You have to, to program it for this kind of stuff. Right?
And, and the other thing is that also the execution time is because of the hardware influenced by other software. Yeah. So other software might impact the execution yes. time. Yes. Yes. So in order to sort this out, uh, I have seen some works in which people, and, and you mentioned it, uh, you randomize. Yeah, you randomize. So uh, you look at the possible impact that caches can have and you, you randomize so that you actually insert into the uh, sample all yeah. possible situations that may happen. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> will these be all? All possible situations? We don't really know. But in principle, you, you can come up with some, uh, let's say, uh, worst case situation. If you randomize it, you know, uh, several different parameters, it's very likely yeah. that you will yeah. end up catching the, uh, the... The issue is not, you randomize, you get more or less all those possible. You solve exactly. all those possible. Yeah. But the issue is that when you get into an internal state, where the execution time will of one iteration and the next one will always be high. Yeah. So you may say, okay, my system can tolerate a very high execution time for one iteration until over, overcome that. But if you start having lots of iterations always having very high execution times, then you won't be able to tolerate it. Yeah, but, that, but, but that's fine because you're catching that, right? So the, 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 no, but the issue here is that he is giving the probability the, the problem there is that the probability of the execution time is not independent. Once you start having a very high execution sure. time, then the next one is dependent on the previous one. Sure. And all this theory is based on the fact that the execution time is independent okay. between one iteration but, and the yeah, next. But there are these two things. So the first is that you are only taking the maximum, which breaks this... Uh, you know, immediate no, uh, no, no, dependence. It doesn't. They, it doesn't. They, the the, the, the no, POT is more sensitive to that. The block is not that sensitive. You know, it's not that issue. I'm talking about something else. It's, no, no, it's, it's, no, it's this. It's, this it's, is it's, always it's, based on the fact that the execution time of one iteration and the next iteration are always independent. Yeah. All this is always based on that theory. Yeah. But, the, but and that the problem dependence is that means, that might not be true. Yeah, but that dependence is on time, which means in sequence, as you said. So if you break the sequences and if you take the values, uh, even if there is some dependence, but if you put them in a different way and uh, you end up removing or just taking out of the sample set just ones that are not you know, subject to that dependence, then you reduce the dependence. Maybe the dependence is still there, but it's, uh, yeah, they, it's, they, it's not exactly there are There are <coughs> papers where they do what yeah. they call declusterization. Yeah. They, they, they have a... a a cluster of high value executions and they pick one representative of that cluster. Or there are papers where they they get all your measurements and randomize the origin. Yeah, uh, but but uh, I, I don't know how, how, how safe another, is that. There was another question I had over there. In, your, in the block maximum, in the left graph, right? You've got the value on the x or the y axis is the work space execution time. Yeah. Right? And the time at the bottom is what? Is your the time at which you sampled? Exactly. Yeah. But if your samples are independent, the sequence at which you get those those samples should be irrelevant. So basically you're No, but that's that's exactly the point, Mike. That's exactly the point. So right. if they are dependent, the sequence is not irrelevant. But by breaking you make it irrelevant. I know, but, so the, but uh, the real world is that they're not irrelevant. You're assuming that they are, but, but in the real world But in are. the real world, you, want, you only use the maximum. That's what you want. You are only searching for the maximum. So that's why... Uh, okay. this, this is fuzzy. <laughs> I, I, no, but I definitely understand that this is fuzzy, because yeah. uh, that assumption is not clearly yeah. satisfied. And, and everybody recognizes that. Like, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it works fine with you. Uh, size of waves uh, and rain, but the uh, computers are not all. Oh, the, not the, 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 yeah, the, the, yeah. the density, probability densities are not smooth in them. Yeah. It, it's not uh, but that's easy the, to use. Exactly. At the end, what you're looking for is the maximum value, right? So this uh, is, uh, yeah, it's a small. But, uh, but, it's, but it's still, I think this yeah. is the future. I, 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 because. Uh, Stack analysis of modern processors, uh, yeah. you can go far with that. So, yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. But, the, but with this, you can actually. So, yeah, this is yeah, a, yeah. No, a, 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 a nice, a, way, yeah. a nice yeah. way out.
and, and yes, uh, that would still also still suffering from all the you know uncertainties. Uh, yes. But all the other statistical analyses do, and some of them are not applicable uh, simply because they are too heavy, and uh, we can't really build up the models that are necessary. Uh, any other question? So for the, uh, you know, many of you are also working on uh, multi-processors or multi-core. Uh, so then you have even more interference across, which will impact on the work yeah, time. Question, so can we? It's always the, it always brings <laughs> us back to the same issue, right? Yeah, and the discussion was about that. I mean, when you're sampling on time, it's the same question. It's, then it means that the previous iteration is dependent on the data model. Yeah. Yeah, that was my question actually, but the discussion already. Yeah, sure. And you have multiple channels, it's not just caches. You have the memory, you have yes, the right. data bus, you have the yeah. memory controller, you have the DRAM, In those cases, you have IO devices, yeah. and when you consider all these states, it's okay, it's <laughs> impossible to consider all the possible states. Yeah, but that's not that's but the idea of using the random. Exactly. Yeah. Since you can't exactly. handle everything, you use your random. But the question right, is so. whether the one input that I'm really going to use from my application is covered by all this randomness or not. Yeah, that, that's so the that's other issue. The, yeah, that's the that's garbage issue. in, garbage out problem. That's the input that's space. Yeah. That's, uh, input so space. you have to be careful on how you obtain the data. You can't just sample <coughs> randomly. You have to make sure that all the samples cover all possible input parameters to your system. So if your function, if your the task you're running has input parameters, you also have to be careful what are the values you give those those parameters in your samples. And perhaps you might even be care have to be careful and say, okay, in a real world system, these these values will be more probable than the others, then you've got a you might also run your samples in, in such a way that those values also have more probability mm -hmm. instead of using a uniform distribution for the input parameters. So it's so one question is, is the following. One question is the following. This problem in particular, so the variation of the input space, it's a, it's a problem that has been addressed exhaustively yeah. by the hardware design people in order to come up with uh, test patterns to check uh, reliability of systems, right? And so the question is, uh, did you see or do you know about possibilities of using these, uh, um, you know, for uh, the generation of test patterns for hardware design, whether these techniques could somehow be used to generate test patterns for software. Uh, would this make any yeah, sense? Uh, I, I think it does. I, I, I don't recall seeing much work on, on this line, but uh, yes, uh, uh, most papers try to simplify it. To, to get rid of the problem by saying, okay, we are just computing the execution time of one path within the code. So they, they escape from the problem, which is, is huge, right? Uh, I think it's connected with test case generation. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but you could perhaps use both yes. techniques together. Yeah. I think that would be a So if you can, for example, bound the input values, so if you know the bounds, and basically reduce the search space a lot and then yeah, you can course. spend more yeah. time inside the of states of the processor of that is um, instead of giving some yeah. value that will not even read. Yeah. So that's way to reduce this design space. Yeah. This is exploration yeah. actually problem. So one uh, last question uh, that I would like to ask you is the following. So this is only on the worst case execution time, which basically means the beginning of all the analysis that we need to do, because what we need at the end is the worst case response time. <laughs> so, and then, uh, of course, we have uh, the whole uh, no, big problem of putting together uh, statistical uh, values. And then, so, uh, do you think this could also be applied to the response times? Uh, because then we really have different pieces yeah. of software that are we, yeah. from the whole system. Uh, we we try with that. Yeah, we, we, we <laughs> yeah. but uh, the problem is that um, we we had uh, well, I, I guess it's uh, a bigger bond. I mean, I don't know what. But the, the, all the, the questions regarding the the uh, test cases, the and the hidden interferences that we may have, 
when you go to the response time, it explodes. Yeah, that's a, a, a mutex and, and, and uh, acid synchronization and etc. So, yes, I, 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 I that that question I, uh, we we I, I, I asked the, the the students to try, but uh, we came to the conclusion that no, okay, this for now we don't see it. We have to do a lot of simplification. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. But but if you have an embedded critical system which has uh, uh, half dozen tasks, uh, the system is very simple, there is not much happening, it might be possible in very, very limited circumstances. Okay. The, uh, maybe for small task sets. If, if they are too large, then uh, all the yes, possible yes. You know, correlations yes. become uh, you know, crazy. Uh, okay. No more questions, then uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you.